everyone, I'm Miranda Christ. And I'm Sarah Radway. We'll be speaking about our joint work with Steve Bellavan, differential privacy and swapping, examining de-identification's impact on minority representation and privacy preservation in the U.S. Census. The U.S. Decennial Census involves collecting demographic data about people living in the U.S. And this data includes fields such as age, sex, and race, and has many important use cases, such as redistricting and funding decisions, such as SNAP, Medicaid, and community mental health services. For these high impact use cases, data accuracy is especially important, since inaccurate data might lead to insufficient allocation of resources for these programs and for democratic processes. In addition to accuracy being important, privacy is extremely important as well. Since census data contains sensitive information, this information being publicly released can have serious consequences. For example, census data played a role in finding Japanese individuals for internment. In addition to being important in its own right, privacy also impacts participation rates, which in turn impacts accuracy. It's important that people feel comfortable responding to the census and trust that their data will be treated as confidential. And finally, Title 13 mandates that census data must not be personally identifiable. So given the importance of both data utility and privacy in the census, we have to answer this question. How can we balance data utility and privacy? The Census Bureau has used a variety of methods to keep its data private. In 2010, it used a method called swapping which was later found to have privacy concerns that we'll talk a bit more about later. So in 2020, the Census Bureau switched to differential privacy. We'll start by telling you a little bit about what each of these methods means in the context of the census. So swapping, the old method used in 2010, involves exchanging data about individuals between groups. In the figure, we have two different populations. One has a greenhouse that's being swapped with a yellow house in the other population. When we swap these two houses, we exchange some portion of their data, so the age of the person in the greenhouse might be switched with the age of the person in the yellow house. The way that these houses are chosen can be uniformly at random or based on some similarity threshold. So we might say, for example, that greenhouses can only be swapped with other greenhouses. While the Census Bureau's exact swapping implementation has been kept private due to these privacy concerns, we know that it prioritizes unique entries. So that means that in the top group, since the yellow house is the only yellow house in that group, it'll be swapped with a higher likelihood than, say, the red houses. The swap rate is the proportion of data that's swapped. So if the swap rate is 50%, half of the houses are swapped. In the context of the census, differential privacy means adding random noise parameterized by a variable epsilon to make the data set private. This achieves a formal privacy guarantee, which says at a high level that changing one person's data only changes the de-identified data by a little bit, where a little bit here depends on the epsilon parameter. Looking at the tables below, on the right, we have a table that has the true counts of various categories. So in the top row, we have a category with age range 15 to 30, sex female, and race white. And the actual population count is 126. Whereas the published population count, shown on the left, is 131. And while these counts are close to the true counts, there's enough noise added that you can't learn anything about any individual. Here, there's a trade-off between accuracy, privacy, and the amount of noise. Higher epsilon means higher accuracy and lower privacy. There's ongoing debate surrounding the Census Bureau's switch from swapping to differential privacy. On one hand, there are the privacy concerns that prompted the switch in the first place. Researchers from the Census Bureau were able to reconstruct 46% of swapped 2010 census data, which is unacceptable. But on the other hand, there's been concern about the accuracy of differential privacy, especially pertaining to its effect on minority groups. There's also been concern about its utility for redistricting. This was the focus of a court case brought by Alabama against the US Department of Commerce. We work to better understand both the accuracy and privacy of these two methods, and we have two different approaches. The first is a theoretical approach, where we analyze how we expect swapping to behave, 
and we find that it should introduce more inaccuracy in minority groups. This analysis is not implementation dependent, and these results generalize beyond the US Census. In our experiments, we recreate synthetic census-like data and simulate a wide range of swapping and DP implementations on this data. We then compare their accuracy and privacy. To give an overview of our theoretical results, we prove two statements. The first is that for swapping, if a subpopulation, or say a block, differs more from its global popu population or state, then there's a higher expected error for counting queries. Here, we consider the counting query that's the number of yellow houses in a population. In the figures, we have two different, or we have a sample block with purple and green houses being swapped with two potential state populations, where in the top figure, the state population is very different. It has many colored houses, and in the bottom, the state population is more similar. Since our counting query is the number of yellow houses in the block, we can see that in the top figure, since the rate of yellow houses is very different between the block and the state, we expect a higher error here. Whereas in the bottom figure, since the rate of yellow houses is the same, there are no yellow houses, we expect swapping to introduce much less error. And this expected error increases further as the swap rate increases and more houses are switched between the two groups. We also show that in general, smaller, more diverse subpopulations have exponentially more unique entries than larger or more homogeneous subpopulations. What this means is that for swapping impl implementations, such as that of the Census Bureau that prioritize unique entries, the error introduced from the first bullet point will be even higher in these diverse subpopulations since they'll have more data being swapped and effectively higher swap rates. So now I'm gonna talk you through our experimental analysis. And in order to compare these two mechanisms, we first needed data to run the mechanisms on. And the Census Bureau only releases de-identified query data, so we knew that we were going to need to create synthetic table data. And we treat the synthetic data as ground truth data for the remainder of the experiment. Even though it is based on 2010 de-identified data, um, we fit the distributions from the 2010 published decennial data. In terms of our methods and metrics, now that we have the data, we needed to develop the de-identification algorithms. And we can't use the true swapping algorithm. As Miranda mentioned, it hasn't been released due to privacy concerns. And the true differentially private algorithm is simply too expensive for us to run. TDA would have been on the scale of millions of dollars for our experiment. So we created several implementations um, for comprehensiveness that follow the Census Bureau's published guidance. And for swapping, we vary the looseness or closeness of our similarity threshold. So for example, if I was 35 years old, if I had a similarity threshold of one, I could be swapped with someone who was 34, 35, or 36. And then for differential privacy and swapping, we vary the bucket sizes by which we group data. So for example, if I had a bucket size of six, I could set a bucket to be between like 35 and 41. Um, and then in terms of our metrics for accuracy, our main two metrics were we used mean squared error to look at impact on the overall population. And then we used a moose smoothed KL divergence mechanism to focus um, more heavily on minority impact. And when we're talking about our data, you can think about histograms of our de-identified data with two categories formatted um, Hispanic yes, no by the 63 census races. For the original and the swapped data, we computed this by counting the individuals in each category. And then for differential privacy, for the combination of these attributes, we compute the true population count and then we add noise. And our combinations are the ones used by the Census Bureau. We then add these counts to get aggregate counts for each race and ethnicity category. For our privacy metric, we perform a linkage attack with a public data set that we create, and we look at the portion of individuals who are identifiable under the linkage attack. So in terms of quantifying privacy, it's misleading to directly um, compare DP and swapping. So DP, um, as editors have mentioned today, only produces aggregate, it doesn't let you learn about an individual. Um, as long as epsilon is set sufficiently, a linkage attack like the one we're gonna use won't work. You can only make inferences from the group. So for example, if I know that most people with a zip code 10027 are white, um, because your zip code is 10027, um, I could probably guess that you are white. Uh, however, for swapping, there is no guarantee of privacy, so we can perform linkage attacks. 
Uh, and for example, if I were to have two data sets, one with name and zip code and one with zip code and race, uh, if I see that there is only one person with a zip code of 10027 in both data sets, I know that that must be your data and I would know that you are white. So these privacy attacks, once again, fundamentally cannot work against differential privacy. And we perform a rudimentary linkage attack to evaluate the privacy of swapping. And to do so, we match entries between a de-identified data set um, and a public database of PII, personally identifiable information. So for example, think like a data set from Facebook of everyone in a county. And we try to use this de-identified data set to learn new information. So if an individual in the public data set has some attribute. So in ours, we tried to learn whether they were Hispanic. And when you look at these graphs, um, you can think about from left to right, uh, more data is being swapped. And on the y-axis, the closer you get to zero, the less individuals are being identified, so the better privacy that you're getting. And on screen, we have results for a diverse county and a non-diverse county. And as you see in both of these graphs, there's this threshold value present uh, where privacy results become far more acceptable. And I would define in the diverse county this threshold to be at around a swap rate of 0.2 and for the non-diverse county, around 0.05. And this value actually also coincides with the value at which all unique entries have been eliminated from the data set. Uh, so when we're talking about accuracy later, it's important to keep in mind these swap rates that can produce acceptable privacy because we can't be using swap rates that are lower than these because they will be un unable to produce acceptable privacy. And one other takeaway from this is we see that the privacy threat is higher for the diverse county. So this led us to question um, if there was any disproportionate impact on individuals in the group who were minorities. And in between these two graphs, notice the change in the y-axis from six to 30. <laughs> it's pretty clear that minority groups are making up the lion's share, if not the entirety in some counties, of populations at risk of privacy violations. So turning to accuracy, uh, we see for, this is for Alameda, a county of high diversity. We used two main metrics, the ones we mentioned before, so mean squared error for the total population and moose smooth KL divergence to focus on minority groups specifically. And we see that results are pretty consistent across metrics. Uh, the minority focused results aren't presenting or aren't misrepresenting overall mechanism performance. So for the rest of the presentation, we're just gonna talk about moose smooth KL divergence. And just to break down these graphs, because I know that there's a lot of information in them. Uh, so you see on the top and bottom on the x-axis, there's the parameter values for the two mechanisms. So the swap rates and the epsilon values. Uh, those are not directly correlated. These are just the ranges that the Census Bureau has published that they use online. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, but those are the values we need to be looking at since those are the ones the Census Bureau uses. Uh, so red and orange lines are differential privacy. Green and blue are swapping. And as the arrows say, left to right, we get lower privacy, so worse privacy the further right we get. And we also get higher error the further up we get. And so turning to diversity level, as we talked about with privacy, we're gonna talk about it here. We have a high diversity county on the right, low diversity on the left. And right away some trends jump out, right? So we see for differential privacy, there's relatively consistent and predictable results. So we have this decaying exponential, and there's not really a super significant difference in error as with swapping, where we see there's a dramatically different performance for the diverse county versus the non-diverse county. And this behavior was persistent across all nine of the counties we ran for, where high diversity counties suffered worse accuracy under swapping, whereas low diversity counties did not. And so this is a pretty big difference between differential privacy and swapping. So when we take both accuracy and privacy into account, we can understand the relative strengths and weaknesses of swapping in the context of differential privacy. So if we return to that value when we were talking about in privacy, that threshold value of 0.2, we said that privacy values were unacceptable if values lower than that. So this is the same county, so we see that value of 0.2 right here. So now when we're talking about accuracy, we know we need to start at that swap rate of 0.2. And when we look at the graphs, we see that around this value, there's a sharp decrease. So we know at point two, we are getting bad accuracy at this point. Um, and this is not the case for DP because it has this decaying exponential. So swapping is producing dramatically different results, not only depending on diversity, but it's also depending on the swap rate producing dramatically different results. And DP is 
as we see comparable or better than swapping at these reasonable swap rates. So in terms of takeaways, our findings suggest that particularly for minority groups, swapping cannot simultaneously have good privacy and accuracy better than that of differential privacy. Swapping mechanisms led to a significant risk of re-identification that disproportionately impacted minority groups, and diverse counties also suffered significantly worse accuracy and privacy performance when de-identified with swapping. Alternatively, differential privacy provided a predictable relationship between accuracy and privacy, and in our results, it performed far more consistently across groups of varying diversity level. So that's all we have for you today. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, we're happy to take them now. Great, so if you have questions, please come to the podium. Hi, yeah, I have a question about the mechanisms, the DP mechanisms you tested. Are they like just Laplace or Gaussian or I'm just wondering like what type of uh, mechanisms you ran? Yeah, so we use geometric, which is mm -hmm. essentially what the Census Bureau uses, mm -hmm. but without a lot of their optimization and post-processing. Sure, yeah, so I'm just curious like, there are some part, uh, some mechanisms that are like one-sided, so like they always add like positive values. Do you think that that would have an effect on uh, on the, your your experiments? Oh yeah. So before we measure things like accuracy, mm -hmm. we take all the negative values mm -hmm. and set them to zero, mm -hmm. um, which makes the accuracy a little bit better. Right. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure how using a completely different mechanism would affect that, but right. like, I guess it's a little bit modified geometric. Right. Sure. I actually have a question about the, um, the, swapping, the swapping methodology that was used by the Census Bureau. Do you know why they chose to prioritize swapping unique or low frequency entries? Uh, yeah, well, if you look at our privacy results, um, minority groups are disproportionately impacted by de-identification attacks. So at the same time, yes, they, when you prioritize them for swapping, their accuracy is also disproportionately impacted, but it's really a trade-off between which is more important um, so yeah, I think that's a question for you to think about, but yeah. <laughs> Got you, thank you. So I had one question about the choice of Epsilon. Can you comment on how the Census Bureau chose Epsilon? Because it seems like you have provided these trade-offs in terms of privacy and accuracy. How is that actually chosen in practice? And how can you ensure that there's no linkage attacks for the chosen value of Epsilon that is used in practice? So it was sort of a long process. At first, the Census Bureau released some sample data with their chosen value of epsilon, and then they got community feedback based on the error of that data. Um, and the community was not very happy with the error there, so they ended up increasing epsilon quite a bit between that sample data and the actually released data. There aren't many strict guidelines on how epsilon should be set because policy hasn't caught up and it's so new. This is the first time the Census Bureau is using differential privacy. Um, so, I mean, they use like their best judgment, but I think this will be an area of ongoing research for a while and hopefully we'll keep tailoring it. So just to briefly follow up, do you have a sense for how well the chosen value of Epsilon uh, compares against the privacy guarantees or lack thereof compared to the swapping uh, approach from before? Because it seems like they are opting more on the side of accuracy. Does that have an impact on the achievable levels of privacy? What was the exact value again? Um, I think because the accuracy of, sw or sorry, the privacy of swapping was so poor, it's hard to imagine that the privacy of differential privacy is any worse. Um, but they haven't released, for example, what would happen if they ran the same exact reconstruction attack on the DP data, likely because that would have some sort of privacy risk. I'm not sure. Um, but... Those are analyses that are harder to do without access to the true data that's collected. So that's not something that researchers like us can do. And the Census Bureau hasn't done it themselves. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions? If not, let's thank the speakers again. <laughs>